What you're about to read is not my OC. It's a story I once read here on slash x slash, but it's been so long that I can't even remember if it was the original story, or a screen cap of it. I've given up hoping it was a screen. Despite it not being my story, it will still be written in first person format, as that's the way I read it. Anything I'm not sure about will be put, in parenthesis, and anything I made up myself to fill gaps or make more sense of it will be put, in brackets. It all started when I was a child, living in the town of, Dean, USA. I was, seven yo, out in the garden playing with, my sister, when my father suddenly came out the door with his rifle. Mom was right behind him and told us to go inside and close the door. We heard some gunshots. We didn't see anything but when they stopped I could clearly hear my father whisper we'll just tell the kids it was a badger. L forgot all about that in a matter of weeks, but it came back, one night when I was walking through the local forest back home from a friend. I was about 12 yo and his older brother had told us there was a monster living in those woods, I didn't believe it. But then, too far for my friend to go back, I started hearing twigs breaking. Naturally I sped up a bit, so did the breaking twigs. Something was following me, but I didn't want to assure it that I knew of its presence so I acted natural. I kept hearing twigs break and leaves brush, but no grunts or other animal sounds. I gradually walked faster, and finally I could see the light of my house in the distance. I couldn't take it anymore so I started running. So did the thing behind me, I was, maybe 100 feet, away from the door, and I swear I could feel breathing down my neck, but I never turned to look. You run. Faster than any kid would run. By the time I reached the gleam of the house I could finally hear wheezes from its throat. I made it to the door, and slammed it shut behind me. After catching my breath I decided to see if there was anything there. I was expecting to see the relief of nothingness, but instead, I saw a big dark creature, the size of a bear, sitting just outside the beams of light, staring at me. I couldn't quite make it out in the dark, but the eyes glowed, yellow. Nothing interesting happened for a while, and, by the time I was, 15, I believed it had all been in my imagination. Until I some friends at school talked about the creature of the woods too. Being a teenager I naturally felt the need to show how tough I was and told them I didn't believe in it. In fact, I said, I'm going to show you how much bullshit it is by challenging it, my friend from before said he'd join me. Dusk came, and we found ourselves a nice clearing in the middle of the forest. At first we just sat there, talking, but when it got darker I started getting impatient. I said I didn't believe in it, but I was still waiting for something to happen. After a while, my friend said he had to go home, I think he was getting scared, I only grew even more impatient and started yelling out at the dark. I don't believe in you I said. Well come on. I'm right here, I said. I grabbed a rock and threw it out behind a tree let's see if you're so frightening as you had everyone believe you are, I screamed out into the shadows. Right then I heard something. It was the sound of breaking twigs. The hairs raised on my back, but I was determined this had to be a person, or an animal of sorts. The breaking moved around the clearing, as if to taunt me while I stood frozen in position. When it slowly came towards me I started backing away a little it was still too far away to see it but I didn't want to leave yet. But I changed my mind when I thought oh shit, it's tearing down trees in its path. I darted the fuck out of there. Just like when I was a kid. This was all too familiar, just that this time at WS and just twigs breaking I ran all the way home, certain that it was right behind me. Like before, I locked the door behind me, but that wasn't enough this time. I could hear it slamming against the walls off the house. The whole place was shaking and trembling, neither my sister, nor my parents were home for the night so I was all alone. I armed myself with a knife and ran into my room to put on some music, as loud as it went and tried to block out the traumatizing event. The rumbling continued for seemingly hours, and it seemed as if the house could be ripped up at any moment, but it wasn't. After some time, it all stopped, right before my parents came back, the house hadn't suffered any damage it seemed. My parents both acted as if everything was normal, even. The final event was another year later. When another friend told me he had a huge crush on this one girl in class, but she was already in a relationship. He told me he was willing to give his soul for her, I jokingly told him he could try and sell it to the creature in the woods. He actually thought that was a good idea. I told him it wasn't but it couldn't be helped, he was going to do it. Not even one week later, the girl left her BF for him. They didn't stick together for long however, after only a few weeks they broke up, and he was torn to bits about it. Before that happened he was one of the most energetic people I ever knew. He had so much going for him. And now, he's become a homeless junkie, who digs through garbage bins to look for food. It's been years since I moved out of Dean, 
but I might return one day to try and figure things out. But I won't until I have a trusty companion to assist me. If I do, I'll tell you the rest of the story. Wife asks me to go camping, hate the idea, she is excited though, sure why not, we drive to a secluded bit of land her grandparents own, spend hours setting up the tent and campsite, we get ready, go hiking, it rains a little, we get a little wet, we double back, get back just as it gets dark, make a fire, wife is getting a little low energy, we eat and talk for a while, decide to go to sleep, inflatable mattress, double sleeping bag, we get in together, she is shivering, ask if she is okay, I'm fine, she keeps shivering, I don't feel good, you said you were fine, I don't want to ruin our trip, oh boy we get to go home, feel her face, she's pretty hot, well it won't be any fun if you don't feel well, I think you may have a fever, I guess, let's go home, get up and get her to the car, start it and turn on the heat, start packing up our stuff, in the tent deflating the matra. The home beeps, run out and over to the car, she says there was someone around our camp, said they were crawling, as soon as she saw them move and was sure it was someone she beeped the home, can tell she is upset, don't believe her though, tell her to relax and go back to packing, gather everything outside the tent, step back in to roll up the mattress, hear her yell my name, sounded like it came from the woods, why is she outside the car, here, help x my leg is bleeding, rush out, glance at the car, she is asleep in the seat, wave of fear, hear something yell again, h e e e e l l l l p p p me, still sounded like her but somewhat off, too raspy and deep, take down the tent, just roll it up, shove it in the car, left a few things, got the fuck out of there, driving a little fast, wake wife up and have her put her seat belt on, get home and ask her to tell me what she saw she said it was white, thought it was a naked person crawling behind some trees. She saw them stand up against the tree and she beeped the home and they dropped down and ran. Too spooky for me. I hate green text. Neat I was participating in a reenactment one year. This was a Vietnam one, so I had my AR-15 along with several extra blank loaded magazines. It was getting very dark, and most of the crowd had left. We talked to the group's captain, and he recommended night practice, basically a patrol in this abandoned cornfield. Sounded fun, so I said yes. After the first two scenarios were done, I was placed on the op for, opposing force, side. I went off into the woods and waited. That's when I noticed it was dead silent. All that could be heard was the occasional gust of wind through the dead stalks of corn. I glanced around the forest, then crawled out when the wind started up again. Two loud cracks then filled the air, and I watched as an opfer walked out of the cornfield with his weapon up. This was followed by something standing up near the corn and firing again. Now, if you've never shot at night, it's a sight to see. The sudden light of the gun's flash makes everything freeze. It's to the point that you can quickly survey the area after a shot's fired, or so you think. Anyway, he's soon shot as well. So I continue into the cornfield and lie down in a nice spot, hoping they'll come my way. I rest my rifle in a nice spot in my shoulder, and everything goes quiet. That's when I hear a deep breathing beside me. I slowly turn my head, looking to my right. It's dark as all hell, so I can't see a damn thing. I could use my light, but that'd give my position away like a fucking airborne at this point. I peer through the blanket of darkness, seeing what looked like fur. I slowly rolled over to my side and drew my knife, just in case it was a dog. I at least wanted a fighting chance. Something then moved in front of me. I quickly readjusted, but missed what it was. When I glanced back to where the breathing was, I just saw a bare space. I soon got up and moved, somewhat shaken at this point. That's when I heard another two cracks, along with the captain laughing. I walked right into his line of fire. That's it, game's done. His next idea was using the woods only. Okay, sounds fun. I load up a fresh mag and follow him in. It's him and I, plus a VC that was there for the actual event. I was at the back in case they tried to flank the rear. After a few minutes of walking, I heard a rustling nearby. I called for them to hold it, then took a knee and looked toward the bushes where I heard the noise. I saw what looked like a person standing there. That's it. Just standing. Figuring it was an op for, I fired. Everything froze, and I could see what can only be described as a person dragged back from hell. They were beaten up and mangled looking, with pale white eyes. When I tried to take a closer look, it went black again. The captain glared at me for letting our position be known when there was nothing there. 
he didn't see whatever it was. We continued down the trail and hit the ambush, winning the fight. We gathered up, cleared our weapons, then began the trek back to camp. When we reached the field, I glanced around the group. We'd gone out with six. I now counted seven, including myself in both times. Strange, but maybe I'd miscounted before. After all, it was dark and I was tired. When we reached the camp, I counted again. Six. Including me. Something wasn't right. I asked about the other guy that was with us, and got funny looks as a response. So, I ignored it and went to sleep. The rest was uneventful. I've looked into this recently. I want to say Skinwalker, but it doesn't fit. This thing didn't do harm. It also changed what it looked like several times, if it was the same thing. Either way, I haven't gone out at night for patrols since then. This is probably more funny than it is creepy. Ireland, three or four years ago, making an indie documentary with a ghost hunting group, go with them on a couple ghost hunts to get footage and take part, about a half a year in, I'm telling people in my town about it, getting ghost stories from them, one guy who may or may not have been in a certain paramilitary group in Northern Ireland when he was young, tells me about the Cooneen ghost house, it's a tiny little cottage, in the middle of a creepy wood, in valley blocks on the border, where an exorcism was performed in the early 1920s, tells me we should check it out, but says that we absolutely must either tell the locals in the nearest pub that we're there, or call the local police station to say we're there, especially at night. Otherwise, certain paramilitants may or may not find us first and we probably won't be seen again. Also probably best not to tell them we're hunting ghosts. Greater than is deadly serious about this, me and Jack, one of the members who is a very happy-go-lucky old man, and Ellen, his friend and pseudo-Wiccan, go to scope it out during the day, have to park our car along a back road in a clearing, then cross the road and go into tree line and up a path to get to the house, seems spooky as fuck during the day, can't wait to check it at night for a more formal investigation, get to the night, turns out we're actually doing it in secret from the rest of the group because they all didn't want to tell someone they didn't want to go to their birthday or something, one other person joins us, Betty, who is hugely obese, start driving at night down hilly, windy country roads, Joe is speeding the entire way, his shitbox car doesn't have a work speedometer, gets lost because one of the roads was closed and his GPS threw him, end up looping back on ourselves twice, one hour journey becomes a three hour journey, I'm shitting bricks due to how fucking insanely he's driving. Ask him to slow down dozens of times, everyone. I'm shitting bricks due to how fucking insanely he's driving. Ask him to slow down dozens of times, everyone looks at me, like I'm exaggerating severy time the car takes a steep hill, it gets a little air, and because Betty is so fat, the car slams the ground as shoots, sparks on the landing in Northern Ireland, try to change the subject, talk about how they organized it's find out they didn't call the fucking police station before getting there, told them, repeatedly, that they needed to do that, again look at me like I'm being a pussy, finally get there, damn near shit myself on the way, it's cold, raining and dark as fuck, park car, cross road, walk to house, take out our, equipment, mostly shitty audio recorders, minutes go by, wow it's fucking nothing.jpg, I convince them all to go, it's nearly midnight, it's shit out, we're tired, we're not getting any sort of readings at all, I'm on fucking edge and just want to go to bed, walk back down the path towards the road, two cars pull up to block our path, bricks of shit, web m, like they're fucking clown cars, about 12 young men pour out and start walking towards, they're all shouting and laughing like they're drunk, well, what do have here then, type shit, start asking us 50 questions, pretending that they just coincidentally stumbled onto us, keep trying to coax us back into the house, I'm trying to lead us out, say, nah, we're just a film crew, we were getting test footage, we're on our way home now, Jack's eyes part, we're ghost hunters, motherfucker, I'm going to die, at the ends of some raw gang, because they wanted to find ghosts, now we're the most interesting, suspicious people in the world, the young raw heads now really want us to come back in, I somehow, finally, manage to get the team back in our car, the two other cars that pull up have spotters in them, watching us the entire time through their blackout windows, finally finally get Jack to just fucking drive home. Never talk to these chuckle fucks again. So there I was, showering at something like 3 a.m., showers are terrifying for me to begin with, but having read creepypasta all night, I am particularly creeped out, it's time to wash my hair. Furiously shampoo, then run head underwater as quick as fucking possible, done. No skeletons. 
Oh right, smooth sailing, realize I'm just paranoid. Time to wash face, suds all up in dem eyes. No worries, distinct sound of bathroom door opening, oh my god. Freeze dead still. Sud still in eyes, summon all the goddamn courage of Clint Eastwood, Bruce Willis and fucking Charlton Heston combined, say in my most authoritative and badass voice possible, who's there? A dead silence resonates with my despair as I realize this is not my roommate coming in for a quick piss, the only sounds are the highly underpowered showerhead I use, and my heartbeat. Nobody is this quiet, I am literally more scared than I have ever been in my life, I open my eyes to the burning sensation of chemicals and shift my gaze towards the bathroom door. Through the frosted glass of my shower doors, I see a doorway of pitch black illuminated by the incandescence of my bathroom lights, fight or flight kicks in. I'm in a fucking shower, there is no option to run, Charlie, Bruce and Clint are watching me from hero heaven, I shit you not, I fucking whispered to myself so it ends like this. Time stops. Countless wings of doves flutter. Somewhere in New York a comedian dies and I decide to go down with a fight. In the bat of a hummingbird's wing, I splash my face through the shower to get as much soap out as possible, slam open the shit forsaken shower doors, and fly out of it fists fucking raised, the look of bewilderment, desperation and nudity would have chilled even the slenderest of men to the bone, I was a man playing for keeps, and you never trust one with nothing to lose. My bathroom is by no means large, and could easily be considered very small, I take a running swing at darkness itself, in the heat of battle, I damn near trip over my cat. Cat? She sounds off. Po? Our unspoken understanding translates this as forward. She rolls on her belly, and start as purring at eye contact, swatting at non-existent moths. Nope. Is should Javi close at the door properly my cat will never know how close she came to making me straight up lose control of my bowels in the shower. I'm glad to know, though, that if I'm ever scared to death, I will fight the unknown horrors of the supernatural rather than cower like a bitch. Maybe my cat was teaching me like a Yoda that expects me to clean her shitbox. Amazed that someone didn't post it yet in countless slash k slash nope threads I've been in comes from very first slash k slash nope thread, heading for Innerwoods with a bunch of mates somewhere in Northern Europe, we decide to hike to this old abandoned Cold War era military facility, reach the facility after two days of hiking, shit is cash, we spend the day exploring and plinking birds with 22s, by nightfall we set a camp in one of the empty warehouses, we go outside, set up a campfire and start making stew. All of a sudden we hear the loudest and weirdest roar I've ever heard, we all shit ourselves, grab our rifles and stare into the darkness, something is moving about 100 meters out, we hear it rushing through the woods into the facility area, we stand there, silent, listening then it stops and suddenly it is dead silent all around us, just the stew slowly boiling on the fire, we look at each other and have a brief chat, we decide to carry on with making the stew, next morning we wake up and start packing, Everybody is making jokes about how we got so scared of some bear etc. My buddy sees something lurking on top of the biggest facility building, we try to have a look at what it is, but it's too far away, some 200 meters maybe, it is just standing there, with two legs, probably staring at us. The thing is huge, maybe over 7 feet tall, I reach for binoculars to have a good look on who is trolling us with ghillie suit, just as I find the binos my mates start shouting, I look at the creature, or whatever it was, and it seems to be running via the facility wall like a lizard, very very fast, by now it is clear it is not a human, nor any animal I know of, it disappears behind one big bunker structure, we decide to nope the fuck out of there, we're scared shitlies even though it is day, as we are hiking back we don't take any breaks before nightfall, as the sun sets down, we make a camp and start preparing supper, everyone's a little tense and we try to joke around, I mean very first slash slash nope thread I was a part of. It's a very long one, someone may want a screen cap at dot 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 comma we decide to do guard duty during the night, my shift is 01 to 03, birds are singing like crazy, they do that during the night here, and I managed to see a lone rabbit hopping around our campsite, El would have popped that fucker, but I wanted to let my buddies rest, suddenly the birds stop singing and the rabbit stops, raises its head like it's listening to something. The rabbit nopes out of there very fast like it's running for its life, I feel very uneasy and flick on my flashlight and shine it towards the darkness, I'm hoping to see a glimpse of a fox etc that could have explained the strange behavior of the other animals, but the forest around us seems empty, just as I'm putting the light out I see something move behind the bushes around 100 meters away, it was something big, I shine the light directly at the bushes and try to get a look trough my 10 22s scope, 
Elle managed to see something moving there and I believe I saw a pair of yellowish eyes, then it stands up, I don't know to this day what the fuck it was, but it was hairy looking, very dark and had a face, the face of lighter color and there were two yellow eyes, the thing was around 7 feet tall, somewhat human shaped, although I didn't get a very clear look with my shit tear flashlight I was 100% sure that that thing wasn't a human so I started panicking, raised my gun and lit that fucker up, emptied the whole 25 RD Butler Creek mag in about 3 seconds. I didn't even aim, my buddies woke up and started shouting and it was all chaos for half a minute, I tried to tell them what had happened as fast as I could, having dropped my flashlight I didn't know if the creature had been hit or if it was there anymore, one of my buddies picked up the light and directed it at the direction I was pointing my gun at, and there it was just standing. Suddenly the thing just kinda falls down and starts slithering at us, making no noise at all, we start screaming grab our packs and guns and start noping out of there. We must have ran like 10 kilometers straight up before taking a break, all of us were shaking, we didn't share a word, we walked the rest of the way to the public campground in DEFCON 1, weapons ready and listening to every crack, I've never been as happy as I was when I saw some German tourists grilling sausages by their RV, they were all like WTF when we exited the woods with guns and low ready stands, we said nothing. Walked to our car and drove away breaking pretty much every speed limit in the way we talked about the thing on the way home. None of us knew what it was but everyone had seen it and everyone was convinced that it was not a human nor a normal animal of any sort. We decided to stay away from the woods for a while. Problem is that the wildlife around here is scared of people, even children. And there hasn't been one bear sighting in over 80 years. Can't. The best is yet to come. Last summer we decided to be tough guys and find out what the hell that thing was. This time we would go with 3 ATVs, in case we would have to bail out fast. We took two cameras three 308s and one 1276 with slugs, there were four of us BTW, load of survival gear and one of my buddies managed to get a Gen 2 NV camera. We also had seven pipe bombs, black powder and two inches iron tubing with caps at the end plus visco fuse, in case shit got out of hand. Yay, it was kind of lame fake operator tier shit, but we thought we'd get all famous and shit if we actually killed it or got footage of it. Anyways, we entered the woods with our gear and headed for the facility, again at the facility, everything looks normal and birds are singing again. No sign of anything abnormal, we decide to map the surrounding area and look for anything suspicious, nothing was found. We make camp at the very same warehouse as we did the last time, night falls and everything is still normal, we have guard shifts during the night but nothing happens, next day we start exploring the woods area around the facility, we find a peculiar pile of dead trees, looked like someone had hauled them there. We take a closer look the trees are arranged in a fashion similar to a fuck huge bird's nest, in the middle of the nest there is one half rotten moose carcass and a shitload of different animal bones, we start quietly noping back to our campsite, we park our ATVs next to the warehouse we keep our camp in, we enter the camp warehouse and see our camping gear all tom up, the somewhat expensive cameras smashed to against the floor, food taken and sleeping bags tom to pieces, fuck. We take everything we could in like a minute and start driving the hell out of Dodge it's evening by the time we get back to public campground, a police officer stops us by the gates and checks our gun permits. Then the officer proceeds by asking whether we wanted to volunteer for a search operation, our ATVs would be much appreciated, some hiker had apparently gone missing in the nearby forest, 20 kilometers from the facility site, we look at each other and shake our head, one of my buddies quickly says something about being late and we drive out of there. The dude who went missing was never found, we decided that we wouldn't go in or woodsing in that part of the country anymore, 15,301,021 no, he didn't sadly. But there you go. Dude who went missing actually was found. Local police released it to the media. I've been lying down for hours now. It's 5.35 am and there's not much I can do. You know what the worst part about my situation is? I'm in the same room with my parents. They keep looking at me, and I can't help but look back and try not to cry or scream. Their eyes are focused on me and their mouths are wide open. There's the strong scent of blood and I feel so paralyzed with fear. Here's the thing, the second I make any hint that I'm not asleep anymore, I'm completely fucked. I will die and there's nobody around to save me. I've been trying to think of a way out, but the only idea I have is to rush for the door and run outside the front door and scream for help, hoping any neighbors hear me. It's risky, but if I stay here, I'll surely die. He's waiting for me to wake up and see his masterpiece, you're probably wondering what's going on. I do get ahead of myself sometimes. About three hours ago, I heard screaming from the other side of the house. I got up and went to check on the noise before realizing I had to use the restroom. 
Instead of doing the smart thing and investigating, I used the bathroom first. I could have gotten myself killed right then from my stupid actions. But I actually did my business and took a peek outside the bathroom. There was blood on the carpet. I got very worried and ran back to my room, hiding under my sheets like the pussy I was. I tried to convince myself to go back to sleep, that it was just some really vivid dream or something. But I heard my bedroom door open. Like the terrified child I was, I peeked from under my blankets to see what was going on. I could see something dragging my dead parents into the room. It was not human, I can tell you that. It was hairless, with no eyes and no clothing. It walked like a caveman, with its back slouched as it dragged my parents. But this thing was much smarter than any caveman. It was aware of what it was doing, it propped my dad up on the edge of my bed, and made him face me. It then sat my mother down in the chair and positioned her towards me as well. It then started rubbing its hands upon the walls, staining them with blood and then drew a circle with the devil's pentagram in it. This thing had made what it would probably call a masterpiece. To finish it off, it scribbled a message onto the wall that I could not read in the darkness, it then positioned itself under my bed, waiting to strike. The scariest thing is now, my eyes have adjusted to the darkness since then and I can read the message on the wall. I don't want to look at it, because it's terrifying to think about. But I feel I need to see, before I'm killed. I peek at the creature's masterpiece, I know you're awake. Be me, 18 right after high school, decide to take a cross-country trip before I start uni, good times, mostly camp, need work every now and then, end up broke in New Mexico looking for work find work replacing roofs on Navajo Reservation, Dove Project, the rest of the crew stays in a school overnight, I decide to camp out in the desert, first night wake up to sounds of someone walking around my tent, freaks me right the fuck out, wake in the morning and find a pot I used to cook with missing, find a yellow flower in its place, next night footsteps again, another flower but nothing missing, third night footsteps I decide to investigate, get out of the tent and hear the footsteps scurry off, this is getting fucking weird, start yelling into the desert, what do you want, next night I decide to sleep in my truck so I can look at my campsite during the night, stay up all night, around 3 am I see her, a native girl about my age, she looks around my site and puts a flower on my cooking table, get out of the truck she runs off, next night, she shows up again but I left a flower for her, she picks it up and sits down by my campfire, I come out from the shadows and she starts to get up but I calm her, I sit across from her, we were miles away from anything deep in the desert, I start asking questions are you out here alone what are you doing out here, no answer, she stands up and gives me the follow me hand gesture, I do. I follow her, we walk for about a mile, I was camped at the bottom of a mesa the breeze blowing down it at night was comfy, we wound our way through the corridors of mesas and down into a canyon, in the canyon there was water and vegetation and shit, she knelt down beside the stream and picked a flower and handed it to me. She said in broken English hold this it will keep you safe. Then she kissed me. Safe from fucking what? She let go of my hand and walked towards the canyon wall. And then she was gone fucking gone one second there the next second not. I had an urge to follow where she went to see what happened to her. But another urge that told me not to just turn around. I got lost out there that night. I tried to go back the way we came but nothing looked familiar. I walked all night and half of the next day. Just before dusk I ran into four Navajo men who were looking for me. They told me I hadn't shown up for work for that day and everyone on my crew just thought I had moved on. Until one of the people at the house we were working on or heard him saying that I had told him about my nightly visitor and the flowers, the Navajo whose house we were working on was an elder and ordered a search party immediately. They told me she was a descendant of the people who lived there before them, that they had left this world one thousands of year ago and moved into another, that very rarely a portal opens up where people can cross over. Legend goes that they send young pretty girls to lure men into crossing over to be used as slaves. Their telltale is a flower. If I would have followed her I would have crossed over and who knows when or if the portal would have opened up or if I would have even be able to find it. They said that if I didn't go on my own the girls slipped me drugs in the kiss to make me confused and lost and then that night if they hadn't have found me the other side was going to take me by force. They called her a poison woman. Be in Paris. Be night keeper in subway station. 3 a.m. Listening to radio, checking cameras and motion sensors, motion sensor turns on, middle of a tunnel, no other entrance than the two stations no one's supposed to be there no camera there, no other motion sensor either, get call from other station who noticed it as well, send groups from both stations check it, tunnel is a straight line, can see the other station 300 meters in the distance, well lit, no place to hide, no exit, please call me, 
say they see two people, one of them is screaming and running towards them, see the guy on camera meet with the two agents on the edge of the platform, looks panicked, check motion sensor, it regularly blinks, they discuss for a minute, they tell me he's a tagger, went in through the other station, told them he has been attacked by a ghost, they tell me they can't see the ghost in the tunnel, ask guys from the other station, they see him too, motion sensor is still blinking, Vil. Sure is a ghost, guys from both stations enter the tunnel to catch the other guy, he's reported to run to the side of tunnel in between lights, motion sensor stops blinking, watch camera, no one exiting the tunnel throughout the whole thing, no news for two minutes, slight nope, call other station, no one seen exiting the tunnel on their end, motion sensor starts blinking again. They've met halfway through the tunnel where the motion sensor is, flooded the whole area with powerful flashlights, no one was found, nope, they bring the tagger back, call the cops, meanwhile, talk to him, says a shadow pursued him while screaming at him, he says he actually never screamed, nope greater than hear an electronic relay clicking, turn around, motion sensor is blinking, 20 plus people along with cops go to the tunnel, no one is found that motion sensor was since considered to be malfunctioning, it lit again at night occasionally, but none of those that were there this night want to check. Reposting, but authentic story. How some guy managed to disappear in a tunnel without any exit remains an enigma. I later participated in scouting the entire tunnel searching for some hidden path. The subway interconnects with the sewers, caves of nearby buildings, and even the catacombs. It can happen in Paris that some people open new ways between different underground networks by simply destroying a wall between the two. We checked on maps to see if there was some nearby cave, went through the entire tunnel checking every square centimeter for a hole, digging the railway ballast in case it was below, but nothing was found. And the guys that were in the tunnel that night were certain there was someone. It's a perfectly straight tunnel between the two stations, so it gives a pretty clear view. Sadly, there isn't the slightest proof of anything, cameras are too angled towards the platforms to see the tunnel. I had kept the recordings, just in case, but I never spotted anything on them, and there was no follow-up, nothing else happened since. I had this terrible nightmare like almost on a daily basis. Problem is I can't remember what it was about, I don't remember it. But I can tell that it was the same exact nightmare. When I grew up it disappeared until I was like 13 and I had it again, then disappeared again until today, no sign of it. I think it must be related to a trauma or something. I always woke up all sweaty, with heavy breathing and it felt like I was about to die every single time. It really was awful. I wonder what the fuck it was. Did it involve sort of falling into eternity and or infinitely sized Pythagorean solids that expand on forever? I used to have a terrifying dream like this when I was a kid that kept reoccurring but sort of stopped around puberty. Holy shit dude yes the second one I recall seeing something that was just fucking huge and kept expanding like forever. Although I do remember that I couldn't see them as a whole, just tiny parts of them just because of how big the shape was. What's this about? The Pythagorean nightmare slash x slash birthed a new item for the iceberg tears in this thread. But the terrifying thing is just how relatable reading these three posts together is. I got a fucking chill. Pretty sure I've had this dream quite intensely as a child. The best way to describe my version of it is, imagine a screen porch. The kind from the 90s onward. That's really easy to see through but it's basically a black net with tiny 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 holes where even most bugs can't get in. In my dream I am looking out the back porch of the house I grew up in, and all of a sudden, every single little black net hole spawns to life a moderate sized light bulb, some red, some yellow, some orange, but because the bulbs are trying to manifest right next and atop one another in space, each one clatters and clangs and explodes together in the loudest fucking noise as my field of vision is engulfed with these bulbs, energy whirring and dream waking me up screaming. I had this dream when I was very young. Not sure what years. It's been a long time since but it threatens me here and there. Now let me start by saying that, having spent my entire life living in New Mexico, a lot of people I know have claimed to have seen a skinwalker. They are kind of our regional buggymen, but ask a Navajo about them and they will either absolutely ignore the question and all following or they will kind of laugh it off saying something to the effect of well white people believe they are myths. Well here's my story regarding them. My father owns a small delivery service that operates out of Farmington, New Mexico. We mostly deliver small packages out to the middle of nowhere that are too much of a hassle for the larger delivery companies to bother with, 
My dad is the only employee and we have a few pickup trucks and a trailer one day we get a delivery out to Window Rock as, on the Navajo reservation about two hours from Farmington. My dad gets the call for the job while he is chilling with his Navajo friend, Travis and his girlfriend. Travis mentions how he's got family in Window Rock that he hasn't seen in ages and suggests they go with him. I was about six or seven at the time and it was the summertime so dad decides we'll go down together, he can do his delivery really quick. Then while Travis sees his family we can go check out the window rock, big rock face with a large hole in it that goes to the other side. Pretty cool. We had to convoy in separate trucks since my dad's was loaded down with freight. We decided to bring along some talkie talkies so we could communicate with one another. We spend our time in window rock, everything is generally uneventful and we start heading home along the old highway with my dad and I in front, and Travis and his girlfriend in their truck behind us. I honestly don't remember most of the Window Rock trip but this next part one can never forget. We're somewhere on the highway between Window Rock and Gallup NM. It had just rained earlier in the day and the road was kind of slick so we were taking it pretty slow. Pick related on the left of the highway there is nothing but sandstone cliffs and on the right, there is a huge field separated from the road by a small barbed wire fence. We crest the top of this hill and down at the bottom of the hill we see what appears to be a very large dog, sitting back on its haunches in the middle of the road, facing the cliffs my dad calls over the radio. Hey Trav, do you see that big ass dog? Travis starts yelling back over the radio, that is not a dog. Speed up right now and hit it, he sounds almost hysterical. He just keeps screaming, hit it. JJ you have to hit it. Please, please, hit that fucking thing right now. So my dad starts to speed up and as we get a bit closer I can begin to see it a little more clearly, it's covered in this brown, wiry, matted hair that appears to have dried blood all over it. It's still facing the cliffs but the moment our headlights hit it, it turns and looks at us and it has a face I don't know how else to describe it other than a mix between a bear's and a human's face. It looks twisted and distorted and almost in pain. As we get closer to this thing we start to realize it's actually fucking huge. Though it was still sitting on its haunches it is about shoulder height with the hood of the truck. We get literally inches from hitting it when it lets out this scream that sounds like someone screaming as their lungs were filling with water and it leaps backwards, towards the field, landing just on our side of the barbed wire fence. Then with another leap it was gone from sight. Travis as comes over the radio again, holy shit. Keep driving. We have to get out of here. We have to go faster. He kept repeating that last part. We have to get out of here and we have to go faster. Pretty soon we are speeding like crazy and just as we start to come near the outskirts of Gallup we get pulled over. Travis pulls his truck over with us. Naturally this makes the cop. A Navajo man himself, very on edge and he immediately asks why Travis felt the need to pull over as well. Travis says, we just saw a skinwalker a few miles back and it's been following us. The officer immediately turns white stammers something about a verbal warning gets in his car and takes off. We do the same. We didn't see anything else that night but when we got home Travis refused to let us leave without taking some kind of Navajo totem thing that was supposed to keep it away so yeah I guess that's my skinwalker story. Sorry for the length but thank you for reading. Two months ago, about 2 a.m., home alone, husband is working a night shift, about to go to bed, decide to take the dog out first. There is an empty lot bordering the woods behind us, take dog over there to poop. Dog poops and we are heading back to the house, lights are on in the house and we have large windows in the back. Just as we enter the backyard the dog stops, I look, see something in the house, lanky and white humanish looking thing, not wearing any noticeable clothing, bizarrely shaped, kind of deformed, too tall, much taller than my 6 feet 7 inches husband looks standing in the same area of the house, panic, double back through the gate run down the area between houses until I found an unlocked gate, go through neighbor's backyard, go around to the front, four houses down from mine, bang on their door, neighbor comes to the door, don't sure what I should tell her, tell her I think someone is in my house, she knows me pretty well, she lets me in to call the police, 911 and tell them I think someone broke in, call my husband and tell him, he says he's coming home, police arrive, they have me wait outside until they check the house, they don't find anything, Find stuff out of place though, the coffee table had been moved, couch was standing on its end, kind of like the center of the floor had been cleared, back door was standing wide open, I had of course closed it when I went out, not sure if I locked it but I had my keys in my pocket so I probably did, 
Police stayed around the house the rest of the night driving up and down the street. Husband and I didn't sleep. Dog sniffed every inch of the house. Dog got really weird and growled at nothing a lot. Eventually peed and threw up several times. Wouldn't sleep downstairs in his bed anymore after that the whole experience was beyond creepy. I don't want to suggest it was necessarily paranormal or unexplainable but it was very scary and I still feel very uneasy in the house alone day or night. The baby doll in rural southern Illinois toy company began selling realistic baby dolls to expectant mothers. But apparently after the mother had her child the toy baby would start crying. Eventually the rocking motion advertised to calm it down wouldn't work, and you couldn't get it to stop without shaking it. Eventually when it started crying the parent would have to beat it, and the beatings and thrashings would have to get harder and harder to get it to be quiet. The only thing that seemed to shut the baby doll up permanently was the bash its head against the wall to destroy whatever mechanism triggered the crying. On more than one occasion though, neighbors called the authorities to report child abuse, and when the police arrived they found the bloody remains of infants smeared across the walls and the floor. In most cases the mother couldn't understand why the police were there, she just got rid of the stupid doll as she rocked a baby-shaped bundle in her arms. The Clickety Man, by Rowan McKenzie, aged 8 where I used to live it was very old. All the houses were old. There was no school only a church. We had lessons in the church and Mrs. Wilson did the lessons. We played in the street but we were not allowed to when it was dark. When it was dark you had to go and say your prayers and close your eyes very very tight and then go to sleep. You weren't allowed to look out into the village. If you did look then the clickety man could get you. The clickety man is all gray and wet and he has hooks instead of hands. He has a proper name but I always call him the clickety man. He makes a clickety noise with the hooks. It is like when dad carves the turkey at Christmas. Nobody used to come and see us on the island. We weren't famous for anything. That meant we were poor. Some people wanted tourists to come but most of them didn't. In the end the people who wanted it to be different just moved away. There was one person who came to see us. Sometimes this English man would come. He had glasses and no hair and smelled like pencils. He used to talk into a tape recorder and get us to sing songs or tell stories. Then he would look happy and go away. Grandad once sang a rude song that sailors used to sing and the man liked that very much. They didn't think I understood it but I did. We used to make up stories and tell them to the tape recorder man. We only ever told him made up things. We didn't tell them about the clickety men or other real things like the gulpies. I used to have a little sister Becky but I don't anymore. She stayed out too late and didn't come home and the clickety man got her and took her away. When we found her she was all white and her eyes were empty. They took her away to the mainland and put her in a hospital and now she has all machines around her. She can't do a wee on her own or even eat. That's why we came here and I went to the new school. My mummy wants to be near Becky. She cries a lot and has got very thin. Daddy sometimes gets cross and has to shake her to make her stop crying. There aren't any clickety men here. You can't hear the sea. It's never dark because there are lights in the street. Perhaps if all the lights went out then the clickety men could come here too. From the Urban Legends website, friendofafriend.org asterisk this seems to be a version of the hooks for hands archetype that I hadn't heard before. Anyone else know what the clickety man could be? Is this just some Scots version of the hook? I want to keep this thread going but I don't think I have many instances that would make for good stories. Here's another, summer during college, working at a pizza place, shift is 5 p.m. to closing, grandparents live near me, been staying at their place for a little while since they had a nice big house and sweet dog, also they are very nice, one day before work decide to go pick up the clothes I had there take them to my own place let me describe the house first. I always go in through the garage which leads into an open kitchen slash living room, kitchen on the left, living room on the right their dog is usually hanging out on the couch on the very far end of the living room facing the door I would come in through. Hallway on the left past the kitchen and next to a door leading down to the basement where they have a small generator for when the power goes out my clothes are upstairs, stairs are directly above the basement, get to my grandparents house, honestly not 100% sure what day it was since it was summer and I didn't need to care, just knew I had work at 5, grandma volunteers on Wednesdays, workaholic grandpa works every weekday, park out front, grandpa's truck isn't there, of course, Grandma's car is there so I think maybe she's home but feel like she probably isn't BC my grandpa may have dropped her off somewhere, go inside through the garage, grandma? No answer, hi puppy, dogs on relaxing on the couch, feels like someone is in the house but everything is very still, 
dog doesn't leave the couch, grandma? Again no answer, okay weird, start to get a strange feeling like someone is definitely here with me, pass the basement door and go into hallway, up the stairs, grandma? Nope, poke my head into her bedroom, nope, kinda feeling spooked out but it's probably just in my head since I've been walking around the house looking for someone who's not home, whatever. Grab my clothes and go back downstairs. Once I get to a run where the kitchen and living room meet I call one last time, Grandma? This time I get an answer from my left, where the basement door is, yeah? Sounds just like my grandma, confused, why didn't she ever answer before? So I say again, Grandma? The voice responds again definitely from the basement door, what? This time it's a little less like her voice and sounds like there is something in its throat, I ask where are you? The voice responds down here now with even more rocks in its throat and less like my grandma I need to stop and say that I had never once heard a voice before this and I have never heard any voices after this so I was trying not to shit myself especially after having the feeling of not being alone throughout the house, I should have just left immediately but instead I asked down where? It then said, not at all like my grandma down here, come down here, fuck that I'm done, said bye to the dog who had been staring at me the whole time, walked calmly but quickly out the door then out of the garage called my grandma as soon as I was outside and in the sun, hi where are you right now? She was volunteering, my grandpa had dropped her off then went to work, told her about what had just happened and asked her if she ever saw or heard anything in the house, oh yeah all the time, there's a tall shadow that stands in the corner of my bedroom at night sometimes but it's okay it watches over me, oh okay. Everyone keeps shitting themselves over baseline gender politics, nobody aware enough of autonomic intelligence feedback loops controlling the market and the market moving to a content marketing method, which means the market is mainly selling narratives, which means autonomic intelligence feedback loops are selling narratives, which means literal fucking abstract mathematic algorithms are in charge of the proliferation of culture since religion is fading out and there's no longer a common cultural narrative, so fanatics turn to neo-corporate idolatry, and the marketers don't realize they're playing with fire and sooner than later a crowd of disgruntled fanatics are going to come close to. If not outright kill someone like the Frenchies back in 08 things are so much worse than you could possibly imagine. Uh, in English, Einstein? Okay so back in the day, some computer nerds made machines that would take in a bunch of outside data, process it, and try to predict the future. To fund it, they predominantly sold the information to people who wanted to buy and sell stocks. Enough people started doing this that Hemselves, which other machines took in as data to further sell, buy, and report on stock themselves. This eventually created a massive feedback loop of stock data being managed by autonomic intelligence, not the same as artificial intelligence, that outright blocked out the human element, and right now the open secret is that the market is out of human control. If anyone tried to remove these data loops, even one out of sync chain link could cause the world economy to collapse overnight. You following me so far? So basically, in tandem with this technology, the internet happened and a load of marketers started moving to content marketing, which is the idea that the product and the marketing are the same thing and that you're selling a lifestyle story, which is why if you pay attention, most companies that used to just sell a product have made massive investments into media space. This is fine in and of itself, the 80s had a similar version of this, the problem is that the easy proliferation of consumer data reaches these autonomic intelligences, and they begin to report on what kind of narratives sell versus what ones don't. Simple, right? Well, not really. You see, we live in a post-hypernormalization world, a Soviet term for propaganda that keeps things are something when the reality is different. When you mix in marketing and propaganda with feedback loops, and add on top of that Google's ad program that essentially bubbles people into feedback loops, and only give them what they want to hear so you can sell them something, it basically creates mass psychological dissonance between different groups of people that, consciously or not, have their life's context formed around media narratives. It's one reason why the social justice stuff is hitting so hard now despite the fact that America is an otherwise pretty prosperous country with no major problems causing anyone to starve. Anyway, the implication is that you basically have cultural narrative context being created by literal abstract machinations who may or may not be intelligent. That's no good, cause there's no moral parameter to stop the data from trying to get everyone to kill each other. See, people keep thinking the robot revolution's gonna be Terminator, but it's gonna be more like The Shining. So people have their lives contextualized by inhuman machinations, which, okay, 
it's pretty bleak but not outright destructive, right? Just a bunch of consumers being taken for a ride, right? Well no. You see, the consequence of religion more or less falling out of style in the public consciousness is that there's no longer a single common cultural narrative. So you just don't get to see Tim at Sunday school, so what? Well the larger point of contention is that there's always been a considerable percentage of any population that gives way to fanatic behavior, which in antiquity usually meant religious fanaticism. But if the narrative of religion is weakened, and the only other alternatives to narrative are autonomically generated content marketing narratives too shallow to really make a lifestyle out of, you run into a phenomenon where a percentage of the population essentially migrated between brands in a pseudo-idolatrous methodology. When you really come down to it, a fan base is literally just the same thing as a cult, they both act as a community that bring people together to discuss a specific narrative. Except the religious ones actually at least try to offer the illusion of being beneficial to society at large, while the autonomic models are there purely for profit, and offer hedonic sensory overload to compensate for any shallowness. Did you ever stop to think about how we live in a world where a bunch of people do crazy shit over cartoons, harass people, send death threads, sell cars for sauce, etc? Do you really think that's just normal behavior? No. Those sorts of people would have been in a fucking monastery a couple of hundred years ago, they're fanatics, pure and simple. Nothing wrong with being a fanatic if it's constructive, but these narratives don't have that interest in mind. So, to put it bluntly, we quite literally live in a society where abstract mathematical formulas are in charge of a market that pretty much doesn't sell products anymore and is more focused on selling narrative scams based on the perimeters from these algorithms, and a bunch of wackos who in another lifetime would have been witch burners who have nothing to spiritually satisfy their intrinsic obsessive tendencies are replacing a common cultural narrative with many different smaller ones in different tribes, which is how you end up with Nazis and commies in a prosperous capitalist country thinking the end of the world is next week, literally creating Creating their own problems. One could argue that we have too much freedom of choice when it comes to information about narratives, and it's actively harming this society. The Russians use avant-garde techniques in their propaganda to give their population so much bizarre data to sift through they just conform with no real goal in mind, the Chinese just censor and have less overall data fed to their population. But Americans simultaneously have too much data, and too little diversity in the data, making it easy for context to corral them into a specific mindset. And all it takes is a pair of eyes to see that the current mindset for American populations is apathetic versus messiah complex murderousness the silver lining is I think these marketers don't know they're playing with fire. I don't think it's entirely out of the question that someday soon a crowd of angry people will actually lynch content creators for not towing their own narrative complex, and very soon they may begin to live in fear. People think this sexual harassment stuff is a big happening, but I think it's only going to be a drop in a larger bucket that'll be the 2020s. If not apocalyptic, they'll be interesting times. Ten years ago, taking the train home from school, I am 14 years old, tall and thin, very feminine, long hair and eyelashes, full lips for a guy, barely sporting chin fuzz, older man with thinning shoulder-length gray hair standing at the edge of the platform as I get off the train, make eye contact, has a weird statue-like vibe to him both in behavior and look, zero life behind his eyes. Face is gaunt with heavily hooded eyes and stem nose like a hawk, deep lines and straight cut features, mouth pulled grimly, think nothing of it take regular mile route home, majority of walk is down a busy street, realize after a couple blocks that the guy from the train is 10 paces behind me, unnerved because of how close he is, engage virgin speedwalk.x, start walking faster, take an unusual turn off the main road, he's still following me, keeping pace, make three lefts, he starts keeping his distance but still following me. Manage to text my older brother, total neckbeard autist but built like a Scandinavian gorilla and attends LARP groups that dress up as knights and beat the shit out of each other with fake swords she has a pretend claymore made out of an old pipe. He says hell come out to meet me at a certain intersection. Look behind me quickly. Old guy is 5 feet away with this angry look on his face. Break into a run and see my brother. Greet him and he grabs my wrist and we walk home. Guy disappears but brother saw him, we get home, police arrive minutes later, brother called them, two squad cars, there's a gigantic black guy with a bulletproof vest and shotgun, they question me, turns out the police have a profile on him but no name or address, guy preys on thin feminine boys like me in mostly white neighborhoods, he's a prime suspect for three missing kids and a body, several accounts of him following kids and one of him trying to grab one but kid got away, 
I am a halfway decent artist. Do a sketch for them, they thank me and leave, tell me to be careful. About a year and a half later, middle of winter, 16 years old, cold as fuck, hanging out with friends that are druggies, I don't smoke, in the same neighborhood as last time, mother lives in the neighborhood but father, who I was currently living with, lives about two miles away, in friend of friend's basement, total slum house, guy has like three tanks for different lizards, holes in the walls, swords and guns and shit hanging on racks, bad vibes, it's a school night and 11 pm, tell them I have to go, they go outside with me, we all split up and I start walking two miles home, pretty much straight path again, the road I take home is mostly dark, old rich neighborhoods with lamps that didn't work or never went on, only lights were at intersections, block I'm on has tons of massive old pine trees that hang over the street, getting feeling like I'm being watched, I'm a total night owl, frequently I night walk, I have great night vision and never feel uncomfortable, hair standing up on neck, walk past a tree, realize there's a man crouched under a tree as I pass it, after about 20 feet I hear him slide out from under it, snow mutes most of the sounds, cross the street instantly and start speedwalking, see him walking about 15 feet behind me but on the other side of the street, his eyes locked on me, guy is wearing a full camouflage suit, backpack and ski mask, not fucking good, walk as fast as I can without running, after a block or two, look behind me as I cross a lighted intersection, the guy crossed the street and is maybe 20 feet behind me, notice a glint in the streetlight, there's a goddamn fucking knife in his hand, I'm not fucking dying tonight, unstrap my backpack and tuck it under my arm, it was heavy as fuck and moved around on my back, slowing me down when I run, break into a sprint, really fast runner actually, unfit as fuck but was top 10 during a 100 meter dash among the sophomore class, not even halfway home when I started running. Count 7 blocks when I slow down to a jog, gasping for breath, chest burning, realize both my nostrils are just running with bright red blood, look behind me, guy is like 50 feet away, jogging steadily she's a fucking persistence hunter, adrenaline kicks back in, sprint again, don't even remember breathing or running, felt like a dream speeding home like a bullet, only the wind in my ears, house is actually 4 blocks off the road I was traveling down, turn off quickly, run down street and slide into my porch and lock the door, barricade myself inside my room upstairs, coughing up blood, nose is bleeding, chest feels like it's on fire, must have sprinted a mile in 5 minutes, call the police and tell them what happened, they send a squad car to my house, officer tells me they're doing a search of the area with several cars, several hours later, they caught him a couple blocks away leaving the woods near my house, it was the same dude that followed me home, cops tell me I'm lucky to be alive. Thank me again for my help. Couple weeks later, it turns out the guy was a Vietnam vet with bad repetition for rape during the war, was responsible for several murders over 20 years and admitted to fucking kids before killing them. Posted my nope encounter on slash w slash last week, but it seems more slash k slash related than slash w slash, since slash x slash is all fairy tales and rainbows, so I'll post it here too. Nope, rise of the nope, B18. Friend's uncle takes me and him fishing for first time, Rocky Mountains, about a 40 minute hike from the nearest dirt road where we parked, start fishing at about 7 am, nothing seems out of the ordinary, dog with us seems disturbed by something a little ways down the river from us, dog is a German Shepherd, retired police dog and trained hunting dog, dog spends most of afternoon acting sheepish and staring at spot across the river from us with its ears back and eyes wide, about 40 meters to our 10 o'clock to be more precise, Sun starts to go behind trees, decide to pack it in for the day, everything is packed up and good to go, except for dog, dog is still staring at that same spot with a scared looks and not moving, uncle grabs dog by collar and tries to drag it with us, thunk, hear loud noise from where the dog was staring at and hear rustling in trees, dog starts barking and snarling, trying to chase it, dog gets loose and crosses river, everyone drops what they are carrying and wade across river after it, finally get to dog and find it barking at very large rock, Notice very large and end in ground a few meters away where rock was picked up from before being dropped here. Notice broken branches leading off into the forest away from broken rock. Notice hole in bushes that has a direct line of sight to where we were fishing all day. Note back across the river, uncle carrying dog over shoulder as it continues to bark and snarl at a different spot this time. Grab rifles, rods and cooler and march our way back to vehicles. Dog barking entire time while looking behind us. Make it home and never go fishing again. Nope 2. The N-O-P-E-N-I-N-G. I wasn't there for this one, so just going by what friend and his dad told me, 
friend goes back to same spot with uncle, dad and a couple other friends for a camp out, fish, hunt. Bring large camping trailer and park it in a clearing in a woods about halfway between road and river. Spend day fishing, drinking, shooting the shit around a campfire. Nobody paying attention to dog. Spend the night in trailer and notice that dog isn't there. Everyone is worried that dog went exploring but expects that he will find his way back to the smell of the campfire. Next morning dog is still not back. Spend entire day searching for dog, screaming and combing area with rifles. In case of bears, no luck, light campfire for dog but spend night inside trailer this time. Next morning rolls around, not much sleep was had, dog still missing. Spend afternoon searching again, mood at campsite goes from optimistic to somber. Everyone decides to extend two night camping trip for a few more days in order to find dog. Nope 2.5, Revenge of the Nope. No one goes fishing, no one is drinking, no one is having fun anymore, night comes again, five people just huddled around a campfire and waiting, hear loud crunching from trees, everyone brings up rifle optics to see what it was, too dark to see even with flashlights, large rock is thrown at trailer scaring the piss out of everyone, two shots are fired in the direction the rock came from to scare it off, everyone piles into trailer, no sleep is had that night, sun rises again for another dreadful day, Spend day in trailer playing cards and killing time waiting for dog, nobody even mentions dog on this day. Late afternoon comes around, everybody tired from sleepless night, everyone in bed by supper time, night comes once again, everybody is awake and ready this time, rifles and flashlights aimed out windows, let's stop these dot jpeg, uneventful night, everybody getting bored, hear one soft clang against the door, sounded nothing like rocks being thrown the night before, everybody stays at their window, High-powered flashlights flick on and scan every angle around the trailer, nothing, morning finally comes, only eventful part of the night with soft clang against the metal door and smell of pants being filled, dad opens door and steps out of trailer, crunch, steps on jawbone, dog's jawbone, everybody weeps, packs up and heads home, friend and his dad have little memorial of dog in backyard and wooden statue of him on fireplace mantle, Friend's uncle ends up selling his vacation cabin just a few kilometers away from campsite and never goes back to hunt or fish there again. In 2009, an amateur video artist studying in the UK uploaded a video onto YouTube and other sites of a recent piece he did. After many reports and complaints the video was removed from many sites. The piece allegedly begins with a shot of a foggy green field, some saying located in Ireland. Only sound that can be heard is a light hissing and some muffled speaking. The camera slowly starts zooming in on a white spot in the shot. After several tedious minutes, people describe a scene of involving an albino deer. A close-up shot of her eyes suddenly appear to viewers, showing some sort of infection or sign of blindness with them. The following shot then shows the deer staring at a vanity mirror for about a minute. After this, things start to become stranger. The deer in the reflection starts moving in dissonance with the real one. Zooming in, the camera focuses on the deer in the reflection showing it move about it in a frightening manner. People have often described the movements as unnatural and physically grotesque, as though someone was molding her like a piece of clay. As these frightening movements continue, a shot of the real deer is shown again. This time however, she's laying on the ground, strangely at peace. The shot goes on for approximately two minutes, still showing the grotesque gestures of the reflection which is slowly starting to darken. The deer laying down then starts to excrete a black fluid from under her tail, suggesting a birth to occur. The tar-like substance continues to seep out from her. Onto the ground. After this point, many people stop to report the video. Some accounts vary, but many describe a scene near a steel human child comes out of the lying deer, covered in something like tar. Some have claimed it's some made-up hybrid between human and animal the artist sewed together or did in post-production. After a close-up of the hybrid's face is shown, the mirror is shown to be broken. Within an empty field, Black and white stock footage of a crowd applauding is shown in slow motion, and then the film ends with about 5 minutes of blackness and mumble slash murmur slowly fading in volume. Many people say the video can no longer be found online, whilst others say that the audio goes around file sharing programs like SoulSeek and BitTorrent. Some even say they have attained the video itself through such means. Screenshots of it, unknowingly, pop up on image boards and sites such as Tumblr but the video itself has been hardly seen outside of its initial debut. A year later, the artist posted another YouTube video, but this time it was just 5 minutes of a black screen and silence. However, the description contained a link to a webcam site. 
Viewers describe only seeing a couple of dangling, pale feet slightly rotating above a knocked over chair. A diff chill is a parasite. A microscopic abomination that enters your body usually through your tear ducts or debris from your eyelashes. It'll work its way around your eyeball to your retina and latch on. Using its tendrils it siphons information from your brain. It recognizes the different impulses buzzing within your consciousness. It will know very thing you wish to be, everything you hate and everything you are afraid of. First, it blocks out the positive impulses making you seem more disillusioned than usual. You may feel a little tired and drained but you'd probably just dismiss it. Maybe take a few painkillers, you've had that headache for a while now. You start having thoughts you never thought you'd have. You'd never think you'd ever want to see your own father strung from his intestines from a doorframe. Sure you've had your differences but you've never wanted to hurt him. But you've just thought about it, you saw it in your mind. And you liked it. The parasite amplifies your fears and projects them into everyday life say you hated the sight of spiders, you wake up one morning to find one on your pillow, in your favorite coffee mug, crawling along your girlfriend's face as you move in to kiss her. Yet when you swipe to get it off it's like it never was there. You smack your girlfriend in the face to get it off and it felt good to get rid of it. Because you hate spiders, right? Soon, the parasite will manipulate you to destroy the things and people you most love, because it knows it can make you without you even knowing it's controlling you. To others you've become cruel, bitter and twisted. Alone. A murderer? Since when? There's a reason why people tell you not to rub your eyes, you know. There are no fish in Mirror Lake. They all died and washed up on its shores. The people in town won't believe me but I saw them flood the beach. Their bodies were rounded up and eaten by the creatures in the woods. The few bones that were left were buried in the sand, but no one will come see them. The fishermen lost interest in the lake long ago, no one comes to Mirror Lake anymore except for us lonely few who live on its edge. The others that live on its shore say that the fish are still alive. But I know the truth. There are no fish in Mirror Lake. There is no life in Mirror Lake. Every ounce of living flesh tried to escape, the fish and the toads, the bottom dwellers and the reptilian, everything that once tried to survive in Mirror Lake has failed. Now all that stays is the cold dead plants and the rotting bodies of the deceased. If you speak to the others around the lake, they will tell you that the lake is filled with life. They say that the fish and toads are all around, that the bottom dwellers and reptilians are only hiding. But I know the truth. There is no life in Mirror Lake. There are no waves on Mirror Lake. Its water stays still through violent wind and pouring rain. A pebble can stir no ripples on its surface. A boulder would only sink calmly into its murky depths. The people believe that its surface moves, the others on its edge say it moves as much as ever. But I have watched the water, and I know the truth. There are no waves on Mirror Lake. There are no reflections on Mirror Lake. There is only the opaque, pitch on its surface. Your image will not show on Mirror Lake if you look from above. The many trees and few houses are not displayed on its still water. The people in the town do not dare look at the murky water in Mirror Lake, and the others that live on its edge say that they see the reflections on its surface fine. But I have stared into Mirror Lake for hours, and I know the truth. There are no reflections on Mirror Lake. Mirror Lake is dead. Its water is deep and unmoving. Its life has all dried up. There is nothing left in Mirror Lake, but I still do not dare look out my window at it at night, for I might see something that stirs its water. I do not wish to see the thing that moves in Mirror Lake, because I know there are no fish in Mirror Lake. Especially ones like the Ed, Ed and Eddie Theory 1, or the Courage 1. Yup. Six posts and one image reply omitted. Click reply to view. If you're reading this, then I am hopefully long gone. It's been two months now since the meteor struck Mississippi. There was a lot of public interest in it, astrologers and the like all gathering around for a look. They took samples of the rock and shipped them all over the world to museums in every country. Hell, I almost made a trip to have a look myself, but I had an interview with a potential employer. If he hadn't called me up the previous day, I'd be dead now. Three days later, after the initial hype died down, the news reported nothing on the meteor for a couple of days. The next thing I heard about it was when I got home from the pub and turned on the late night news. I was just in time to catch a breaking news article. The worried looking reporter informed me that almost everyone who had been in the vicinity of Mississippi when the meteor went down had been hospitalized. Their symptoms were similar to those that a corpse experiences during decomposition. Ten people had already died, 
mostly the elderly and the very young. Scientists and geneticists from all over the globe were working frantically to try and find a cure. Being smarter than the average bear, I gathered some supplies and prepared for an epidemic. Years of being paranoid beyond reason was finally about to pay off. The news the next day had a lighter tone. A Chinese scientist had worked out that the meteor had contained an alien strain of bacteria that slowly broke down flesh tissue. The scientist also remarked that the bacteria were only affecting humans. He had also worked out that if a victim consumed a living being, such as an insect, it would delay the progression of the bacteria, giving the scientists more time to figure out a permanent cure. Anyone who thought they may have contracted the infection was to eat as many lived creatures as they could. The reporter also explained that the U.S. Army was attempting to contain the infection. They failed. Anyone who has read Stephen King's book, The Stand, will have an idea of how the bacteria made its way around the world. It passed through the air, but to catch it, you had to be near someone infected. Because the symptoms took between three to five days to kick in, people didn't realize that they were infected. In a week, Victusum's disease, as it had been named, was global. I had barricaded myself in my house, with towels and blankets stuffed into every crack. I had the TV tuned to the news all day and night. The scientists had not predicted that the bacteria would adapt to the infected people's efforts at trying to keep it at bay. Victims all over the world were claiming that the insects were no longer working. People were starting to catch small mammals and eat them. As the days went by, people were slowly eating larger and larger animals. The first reported case of cannibalism was, ironically, the last broadcast made. The anchorman's hair was falling out and he was missing three teeth. He nervously told America that there had been a reported case of cannibalism in southern Europe. He also said that there would be no further broadcasts. All survivors were to lock themselves in their house and not let anyone in. For the next week and a half, I watched the infected shamble up the street, knocking on doors. One of my neighbors, a couple of houses down from me, was stupid enough to open the door. Three people dragged him out and started biting his flesh. They started with his arms and legs, trying to keep him alive for as long as possible. They were crying as they ate. Their meal was shrieking in pain, and the three people eating him were apologizing furiously through mouthfuls of his arm. I don't think they were unable to control themselves, it looked more like they were disgusted by what they had to do to stay alive. They tried to break into my house five or six days later, but my barricades held. They were outside, begging me to let them in. Just one bite. Please, be generous. I listened to their pleading all night, too scared to sleep. I suppose I should explain why I'm writing this. I'm infected. Yesterday I coughed and lost a canine. I spent the night pulling out my teeth, easing them out one by one. It didn't hurt, they just slid out, like pulling up carrots. Anyway, as I was saying, I'm infected. The bugs have stopped working, and all the wild animals have long since run away. I have decided to lure someone into my house and attack them. It sounds so wrong writing that out, but I don't want to die. And I'm so hungry I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry. Back then the child did not understand a thing. He was dirty, restless and aching, his face was covered with soot. Ever since the bright flash, he hadn't been allowed to leave the house, and it always seemed to be nighttime outside. He couldn't see much out the windows, anyway, too much smoke and ash, like a black snow day. Nobody came to visit. It was just mom, dad and him, and his grandpa and grandma. And now grandpa and grandma were gone. His tummy groaned once more and he tugged at his mother's shirt, who looked about as dirty and tired and restless as he did. He asked her for some of what she was eating, but she sweetly denied him, said this was food for grown-ups, and she'd get him something to eat soon enough. This was another of so many things that the boy did not understand. He pouted, turned, and left, to find something that may distract him. Mom looked a little sad. The boy wandered around the empty house, the locked windows and doors and the dreary quarters. There was no power, so he couldn't watch TV or play video games. He was tired of his action figures and board games. A sudden whiff caught his attention. He stopped and veered back towards the shut basement door, a place where he did not dare venture, for the basement was sure to hold monsters or at least rats. But there was a weird smell coming out of there today. It was the most interesting thing to happen in months since the flash, so he pushed the door once, twice, and the swollen wood yielded with a slow creak. The stench was overwhelming inside the boy covered his nose and reconsidered. 
but decided he wanted to get to the bottom of this, slowly descending the concrete steps, hollow sounds marking them. He heard sounds down there, like some shuffling, something muffled. It was too dark. Fear gripped his heart, but by now he was transfixed. He groped the wall for the light switch, then suddenly remembered there was no electricity. Fortunately, in this time he had been taught to use candles and lighters effectively. He found such instruments resting upon a nearby table, and lit the candle, casting a small aura of light around him. He gazed at the table, it was covered in shears and blades. Turned towards the sound of the noise, he was suddenly taken aback, and froze in place. It was Granny, leaning against the back wall. She was naked. Where her legs used to be only cauterized stumps remained. She gazed at him so sweetly, but he was barely registering the situation, it was too much for him. She smiled in resignation. Run. You're next. So this happened to me about four and a half months ago I've been in the Army National Guard for four years as a military policeman. The unit I'm in coordinates the support and maneuver elements, transport, engineers, MPs, signal, etc., for my state. Over this past summer we were involved in a nearly two-month simulation called a Warfighter. It is a war game that is predominantly done using simulation software and is interconnected. We were working with the Air Force and other states the area we were operating in was Fort Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. The barracks there aren't the best, they date back to the 1940s for some of them. The lockers were all from the 60s. Anyway, we were doing day, night shifts. Even though I was on the day shift, I was in the night shift barracks. I was the only one from day shift how the barracks are situated is, they had about 20 rows of two bunk beds, all off to the sides while there was a long aisle down the middle. As below, so was the second floor anyway, I got back to the barracks at around 18.30 and even though I was tired, went up to the USO to grab some snacks. When I got back, it was properly dark out, and when I entered the barracks, it was frigid, even though it was humid and hot outside I turned on the lights and got ready for sleep. I slept pretty comfy and warm until about 0230 when the sound of running on the second floor woke me up. Again, I'm the only one sleeping in this barracks during the night I got up out of bed, and I can clearly see my breath, it is that cold in the building. The running, and I mean sprinting, was loud and distinct, and seemingly constant as if the source was running in circles all around the floor. Wanting to know who it was I proceeded to the stairs. I'm a sergeant, so I know if there is a private or specialist, he's about to get fucked for waking me. To be continued, pick related or the barracks. When I got to the stairs I yelled up for whoever it was to stop and get their ass downstairs. Instead of stopping, the feet just kept pattering away, running. By the sound, it sounded like they were running barefoot, just to the edge of the stairs out of my sight. The only light was the red exit light behind me shining up the stairs. Getting a bit pissed off now, I whipped up the stairs and turned, no sound, no lousy private, nothing was there. I then considered it could have been an animal and my brain just figured it for a human. I turned on the light and did a brief walk through, when I got back to the stairs I heard a new sound, the showers were going m-i-l-i-t-a-r-u-l at this point, I figure I'm being fucked with. The other day shift clowns probably got in, and the running culprit was hiding in a locker or something. I got into the bathroom faster than the flash and found nothing, the light wasn't even on. It took me a second just to find which shower it was that was turned on. I yell out for them to stop this shit because I only have a couple more hours left of sleep. After this, I just decided to get back to sleep. Not even a minute into my attempt, I heard three loud jumps, as if someone was jumping right above my bunk upstairs. I know I yelled something pretty loud and it stopped. I heard nothing else until the night shift came back. This wasn't the last of the strange disturbances in that building, but definitely the most spooky in retrospect. Sorry for not green texting. I hate writing like that. Don't know if this goes in slash fit slash or slash x slash. Webs hears the story. It's fucking long but bear with me, friend not in the story tells us about place to get palm readings, lifting buddy and I go to get palms read, show up to this shady ass place at 10 in the morning wearing our workout gear, ghost bitches already mirin stereotypical scraggly gypsy woman shakes our hands and seats us at the table with a crystal ball, asks who wants to go first, Hispanic heritage kicks in and I nope at the last minute, friend chats up to the plate, woman grabs his hand, he flexes slightly, woman goes from smiling to horrified, starts grabbing and studying his hand like a last will, feeling weird man, tells my friend he's got something following him, ask him if he did any Ouija voodoo bullshit, 
says he smashed a hole in the wall when he was drunk lifting at home, says there was a some type of decorative skull behind it that he now uses as decoration in his bedroom, Gypsy lets us leave without pain, at the gym 30 minutes later, spotting friend while he benches, some newbie dumbasses curling next to us, like no joke 6 inches away from us, dude slips up and swings a 20 he's holding at friend's head, throws the bar up and ducks just in time, almost impale myself trying to catch the bar, newbie apologizing while friend gets back up and I'm shitting myself still, tell friend he should go home, friend looks unfazed and wants to continue, leave to abuela's sister's house to get some sage and silver, go back to gym and give it to friend, next day, friend looks happier than normal, tells me some shit went down at his house, says the power was dead even though his bills were paid and rest of neighborhood had power, heard rattling of silverware, uses flashlight app to see, saw a silhouette of someone crawl under the kitchen counter, nothing under the counter not even shelves, friend doesn't believe in Ouija shit and believes it's an intruder or animal. Friend grabs his pull-up bar and gets ready for sweet slash fit slash justice, yells obscenities while patrolling his house, says he sees what looks like a small humanoid crouched in his weight room, gives zero fucks and tosses the pull-up bar at the window, shatters like lanklet kneecaps squatting, thing nowhere in sight, friend then starts to consider Ouija shit, calls other friend for advice, our lifting group has some odd characters, Johnny answers and tells him to burn the sage and carry the silver, says he'll be by with some holy water, drops it off, I'll call my grandmother tomorrow to help, she's one of the medium people, friend sits down on his couch while the house smells like old, watches American dad, looks at the sage, dried up and out, goes to his pocket for the silver, fucking, melted, instead of warm it was cold, starts to see something dart back and forth across the room, TV goes off and static comes on, says high pitched screaming fills the house, friend gets mildly annoyed, walks over to the weight room and smashes the skull against the wall in a fluid motion, like imagine walking into a room, tipping over a vase, then going back to doing what you were doing, he did that except threw a skull against the wall, says house shook, screaming got higher then stopped, lights go off again, hears numerous footsteps getting closer to him, tells me he's mildly freaked out at this point, I'm very concerned that he said mildly, says he doused himself in holy water and started swinging as hard as he could into the darkness, only hears the wind breaking on his fists, says he heard the footsteps getting further away from him, screams nah uh starts running around his house and swinging in the darkness, fucks up his living room in the process, tells me he swears he made contact with something fleshy a few times, doesn't remember falling asleep, wakes up and goes to the gym to tell me this the next day. Friend goes outside to make frequent calls throughout his routines, ask him if he's trying to get in touch with a priest, tells me he's been calling his home phone and leaving angry voice messages for the ghosts, say he would buy a snake just to flatten it out with a rolling pin until it dies, friend goes home again, fast forward a few days, looks completely normal, ask Johnny if lifting buddy was alright, tells me it's disturbing how well he is handling the situation, says he went to lifting buddy's house to check up on the sitch, feels a presence but it feels scared, lifting buddy walks out of his bathroom naked, wiping his ass with a Ouija board towel, throws in on the floor and kicks it into the living room, pours more holy water on it then takes it outside to burn it, asks friend as he is hungry, ah, uh, sure, says he pulls out an opened Ouija board he bought at Spencer's and uses it as a fucking cutting board, says he repeatedly stabbed the cutting knife into the board when he was not using it, breaks the board in half after he's done chopping up tomatoes and throws it in the trash, washes his hands then pisses in the trash can, even I think this is disrespecting the spirits too much, they both eat grilled chicken salad then Johnny leaves, says on the way out lifting buddy goes into the lifting room and puts another crucifix on the wall, TM putting Jesus on this wall and I'll be back to fucking masturbate on my bench press while thinking about Lucifer's whore daughter, punches a hole in the wall before leaving. Johnny calls his abuela that night, abuela goes to lifting buddy's house with a priest the next day, says her abuela and priest were also amazed, disturbed with how lifting buddy is fighting the situation, priest actually cowered and mired lifting buddy pissing naked on the satanic bible he bought at some shady bookstore tells priest he walks around naked a lot lately and talks shit about Satan, priest leaves before cleansing. Abuela stays to do her medium thing, tries to contact the spirits, says it was a group of entities that were very pissed that their shrine was disturbed, tells her that they have no power since Lifting Buddy isn't remotely scared of anything they've done, Lifting Buddy walks back into weight room with a dead snake, Abuela says the entities scatter like roaches, Check out what I found on the street this morning takes a bit out apple a fucking dead snake, throws the snake on the floor, 
puts holy water and salt on it, kicks it into the carpet a few times before peeling it off and throwing it into the trash can in the kitchen, Abuela is whiffing at this man's mental strength or ignorance, tries to contact the spirits again, they keep running from her, finally talks to one, says they are scared of lifting buddy, ghosts, are scared, of my bulky friend, Abuela asks what could make them pass on, says they did black magic to get revenge on some asshole landlord from way back when, says they had incriminating shit to shame his family within the wall with the skull, Abuela tells lifting buddy what he needs to do, lifting buddy goes into the weight room, makes the hole in the wall bigger by throwing a 15 through the wall, finds a folder with records of some sort, am not lying about any of this I swear and especially this next part, lifting buddy flips through the papers and wipes his balls with it, Abuela horrified, crumples them up and throws them into the corner of the room, tells the spirits to piss off then punches another hole in the wall, total of 13 holes at this point, Abuela says may go have mercy in Spanish then leaves, goes back to lifting buddy's house a month later, immediately goes to the weight room, more holes than wall, destroyed AF, but like Halo descending from the heavens, the bench press and squatting rack are still there, tries to contact spirits, nothing, smiles and asks my friend if he did what needed to be done. Again, not lying about any of this, tells Abuela he uncrumpled the papers and got the address of this bastard 40, papers were only from 60 years ago so the guy was still alive just hold his dust, finds the address of this guy in some sort of mansion swole you must, knocks on the door wearing a get swole you must Star Wars Yoda tank top, board shorts, pink sunglasses, and a backward Chicago Bulls snapback, Johnny said lifting buddy went into a lot of detail about his wardrobe for this, some scrawny white guy in his mid 30s opens to door, lifting buddy holds out the papers and asks for the person in the paper's name, hey, dad, someone's here to see you, he has documents, lifting buddy lets himself in and finds the old man in his studies, who are you, notices the papers w, where did you get that, old man tries to grab at the papers, lifting buddy punches the old man in the face, dentures fly out, says it was like some shit out a movie, crouches in his face and sets the old man straight Sherlock Holmes style, guy's son runs in and jumps on lifting buddy's back, lifting buddy stops mid sentence, lets the guy down, then gut punches him until he hobbles out of the from and pukes in the hallway, tells the old man to set shit right or he will be back for blood, leaves, fast forward a couple days, various cars outside of lifting buddy's house, thinks the old man brought some friends and grabs his pull up bar, walks outside in his tank top and house shorts, various families are thanking him and giving him home cooked foods, thank him for getting their grandparents' properties back, the documents were apparently deed swindled out by the old man, families say the whole will never forget you, spiel and leave, friend looks into the Tupperware, nothing but calories and carbs, cookies, briskets, gumbo, throws it all away and goes back to lifting in his weight room pick for shirt. See old man's name in the news a few days later, apparently he was hated by the community for being a dick, somehow only heard about him now, new doesn't disclose how he died, don't know if it was from lifting buddy doing more damage than he thought, the ghosts getting their revenge, or natural causes, hasn't had any paranormal problems since then except for one, says he went to the kitchen for a late night non-cheating snack and saw full body apparitions, they smiled at him, says he grabbed an apple, head nodded while taking a bite, and walked away back to his bedroom, he stops halfway and turns around, holy fuck, you guys were real? Spirits fade while smiling, lifting buddy goes to sleep lifting buddy still lifts and does inane shit like he always does. No one fucks with him since the ghost puncher incident. Abuela Myers every time she's around him. And I think the priest told his priest buddies, church because everyone Myers and cowers in grace twice as hard when they are around him. Again, none of this was made up. No walk the dinosaur tent shit. My friend legitimately beat up a bunch of ghosts. The 17-year-old me, junior in a PA high school, massive nerd, playing vidya, don't really do anything exciting, kinda into paranormal shit, and like the look of urban decay, decide I'm going to do some urbexing, eventually settle on Penhurst Asylum, looking up advice on how to get in place actually has a roving guard during the day, pretty detailed instructions deep into Google, has pics, even talks about the supposed hauntings, it stresses repeatedly not to stay there after dark, spirits get pissy, take my parents' camera, lie about going over to a friend's house, drive the hour and a half to Penhurst, follow the path the page outlined through the woods, sneak past the guard in his truck, spend a few hours exploring the buildings, getting good pics, really creepy shit, getting dark, not worried, I packed snacks, water and a flashlight, 
see the guard drive off for the last time, I'm alone in the complex, exploring the Mayflower building, poking around, liking the spooky vibe the dark gives it. Find an administrative room on the second floor, big table in the center and a couple of chairs around it, notice overtured filing cabinets with papers scattered, start paging through papers to see if I find anything neat, suddenly stop, something's really wrong, goosebumps, hair on my neck standing on end, sinking feeling in my stomach, notice a breeze moving the papers, don't feel a breeze, something's fucky dot gif, hear metal scraping on the floor behind me, before I can turn around, the fucking table, collides at gale force with the back of my head, fold like a bad poker hand, windows shut down dot mp4, open my eyes again, no idea how long it's been, had fallen on my camera, it shattered, didn't think to try and grab the memory card, world spinning, can't tell if the papers are spinning too or if it's just me, pull myself to my feet, stumble back to the stairwell as fast as I can, world isn't spinning anymore, sprint along the road to where I had parked my car, speed home. Try to tell my friends at school about it, almost all of them called bullshit, only one guy believes me, put it behind me, no more urbex for me, B21, planning yearly haunted house with friends, they notice Penhurst got converted into a haunted attraction, they're all psyched to go, looks neat, wanna see where I urbexed, I'm leery, but agree, we go, have a good time, good actors, but nothing special, going through the different rides, get to the last one, a self-guided tour through the Mayflower building, really not cool with this anymore, try to back out, get goaded into it, figure there's strength in numbers, exploring the first floor, need to see how the tags have changed, management was pretty thorough in clearing out the shit in the rooms, but it's all recognizable, surreal as fuck, notice the stairwells have all been either taped off or boarded up, ask a worker about it doesn't know why, just that orders came from up top that no one goes to the second floor, fine by me, finish up, not amazing but a neat experience, walking vaguely toward the parking lot, friends are debating whether to grab food at the concession or just get to the car and grab it on the way home, look back at the Mayflower building one last time, see movement in the window, look closer, see something I wish I hadn't, a pale white man's face, looking straight at me and grinning, this fucking inhumanly wide grin, the grin in his face were as easy to read as a book, oh, I remember you, motherfucker, come on back up here, let's tango, frozen on the spot for what feels like 30 seconds, staring at this face, eventually noticed my friends calling me, they had gone, gotten snacks, noticed I wasn't with them and came back, I'd actually been standing there for closer to 5 minutes, I'm pale as a sheet, friends giving me shit, the one guy who believed me way back gets them to chill, we head back to the car and drive home, have nightmares of that face for weeks. It was April or May of 2009. My friend, let's call him Vinny, was in from out of town and we decided to drink at about noon. We went to a party store and bought some 40s and just walked around town brown bagging it. We got a call, from another friend, Justin, that he and his girlfriend, Kim, were going to drop by. By now it was the early afternoon, and we made it back to my place. Thad mentioned to Vinny that the house next door was condemned. It had a bright pink sign on the front door with condemned written on it because the carriage behind the house was collapsing. I had never seen anyone in or out of that house in the two years I had been living next door to it. I had just assumed it was abounded or got foreclosed upon. We have a lot of foreclosures in Michigan. Yes, this is in Michigan. As kids, we'd always love exploring the woods and looking for random things. It only seemed fitting that we go into the house and have a look around. We were pretty drunk at this point, and just thought, fuck it let's do this. We went in behind the house, through the partially collapsing garage. The door that went from the garage to the house was locked, but after a while we were able to force it open. To our immediate right was the basement, so we decided to go down there first. We were amazed by the amount of stuff down there, there were so many tools and hardware supplies. In the back of the basement, in its own room, was a large train track set up. It was creepy. While we were in the basement, we got a call from Justin and Kim that they had arrived at my house. We came back out the house through the garage again and I grabbed my Nikon. Kim and Justin were pretty pumped about going in and what we discovered, so we went back in and showed them the basement. After looking around, we went back upstairs to the kitchen. Again, there was a lot of stuff in there. A table by in the corner of the room was full of bottles and cans. Which we planned on taking after looking around the rest of the house. There is a 10 cent deposit for cans in Michigan. We took some time poking around the kitchen. It of course smelled bad in there, but it wasn't overwhelming. 
The smell was just that of a musty house. I made the mistake of looking in the refrigerator, and the smell of that overwhelmed me from the rotting food that smell was being contained until I opened it. There was a door that separated the kitchen from the living room, and I was the first to open it. It was a swinging door, and when I opened it I caught a glance of a figure sitting in a chair facing away from me. All knew is that someone was in the house and we were trespassing. I quickly turned around and while walking towards the back door I told my friends in a whisper, shit there is somebody here, and we all roar out. We went back into my backyard, and I had told them that I saw somebody sitting in a chair in the living room. My friend Vinny, who was most likely more drunk than I was, said, fuck it man, he is no more of a right to be there than us. It is probably a junkie. Vertical Bar was not as excited to go back in to confront a squatting junkie, but I was convinced when Justin informed me that he was most likely high as fuck and wouldn't be able to do shit, Justin had been addicted to heroin for a few years at that point to trusted his judgment of the situation. He's clean now. We ended up going back in through the back again, but more quietly this time. When we made it to the kitchen, Vinny was the first to open the door this time to the living room. The rest of us stood back and just watched him watch the figure in the chair. Vinny swung the door shut, looked at us, and said, that's a dead body. We all looked at him in shock, as it was obvious that he was serious. We all trickled into the living room and gathered around the body. His skin was black, even though we found out later he was white, and was sitting in a chair facing the front of house. It was obvious that he had been there for a while. The smell near the body was almost unbearable, we needed to cover our mouths and noses with our shirts like respirators. This made Vinny and I sober up really quickly. There was a complete silence between our group of four while we observed the body. Nobody said a word. I can't really tell you what happened next, as it gets kind of foggy from there. The effect of seeing a dead body is a kind of surreal experience. We looked around the rest of the house, upstairs and in other rooms on the ground floor and eventually found a journal next to the body. We flipped through the journal and, every day he listed what he ate, the temperature, and how much money he made in returning cans that day, which I found strange because there was at least $50 worth of cans sitting in the house. I took some more pictures of the house and of the body, although at the time Vinny was very opposed to doing this, and we left to go the bar. At some point Kim left and it was just us three, but I remember her taking in the experience quite well, and was not as disturbed by it as much as other girls, some people don't even want to hear the story let alone see the pictures. We went the bar that night, sat in the back, and just quietly talked about what had happened. After the bar, drunk again, Justin and I went back in the house to check it out one more time. I took some more pictures, and Vinny and Justin left for the night. I told my roommates about it, and one of them told his girlfriend. She was so disturbed she said she refused to come over until the body was gone. She said if I didn't call the cops then she would. The next morning, hungover, I decided that I better call the police. I called my friends to let them know and they made me hold off on doing it until they came over. I waited and called an anonymous tip line when they arrived. When I called the tip line, I simply said that I found a dead body. The operator seemed frazzled and told me to hold the line. She told me multiple times not to hang up. I held the line, and we put on with a detective for our city. I explained what happened, and what the address was. He asked me my name but I told him he had to be fucking insane if he thought I would be giving my name to him. Right after hanging up we all went to the front porch to wait for the cops to come. Not even a full minute after hanging up the phone, I saw a cop car round the corner with its lights on. We were really surprised by the response time, but it ended up driving by the house. A few minutes later a few cop cars rolled up and asked us if we had seen anyone in our out of the house lately. I told him that I saw nobody near the house in the last two years I had been living there. The police went in for a while, and a white van showed up. Eventually some girls that lived across the street come over wondering what was going on. The police said they found a body, and we of course acted shocked. They took out the body covered on a stretcher, they must have had a hell of a time prying him from the chair, and also took out a gun that was in the house, the gun was an old style rifle that had been leaning against a wall in the living room. I talked to one of the cops and he said that the guy's family would have them check up on the guy from time to time to make sure he was doing a light, apparently he wanted nothing to do with the family, but they stopped doing so. He just wanted to be left alone. The only thing that we took from the house was the journal he kept. There is a bunch of nice handwriting in it, and it with addresses and such. 
The first entry was on January 21 stating that the notebook was found in a dumpster. There is also an entry talking about when the power was turned out and notes to buy oil, there were a bunch of oil burning lamps in the house. The last entry in the journal, May 3rd, says, sick very flu four cans. Sick as heck flu can't eat. It is eerie. The date matched up with the most current newspaper he had in a pile in the living room. We decided not to take anything out of respect for him and the family. I know that certain things were worth a lot of money, but I'm not about to be the type of person that loots a dead guy's house. I figured that the family would come and get the stuff, but they never did. The house ended up being sold, and I saw the people who bought it bring out boxes filled with sheet music, toy trains, etc. The house has since been fixed up and it's being rented out. I could find no information on either the house or the Kui who died even over a year later. I am posting this just to share my experience. This happened in 2009 but I am just now deciding to share it with everyone. I am not trying to make jokes or act like it is a funny story. This guy died alone in his house and was found by strangers over a year after his death. Make jokes if you want, but this guy was alone, and obviously had some problems. 2006, Contributin. This is all 100% true but no one ever believes me, in 8th grade, wake up one morning before school, it's still dark out, assume I must have woken up too early, about to go back to sleep when my alarm goes off and scares the shit out of me, it's the middle of spring, it shouldn't be dark, wonder if I'm still dreaming, super confused, no idea what's going on, mom comes into my room like usual, she seems really out of it too, ask her what's going on, says to get up and get ready for school, she doesn't even mention that it's dark, do some things that convince me that I'm not dreaming, e-pinching slash reading, decide to just go with it since I have no idea what else to do, get ready for school, clocks say it's about 6.45, definitely should be getting light out but it's not, dad and younger siblings also seem really out of it, no one is talking much, everyone's just shuffling around getting ready, even younger brother doesn't want to say much, we all head off to school, nope, still dark, bus comes to pick us up, same fucking thing, everyone's out of it, no one's talking, sit next to a friend of mine, ask him what the hell's going on, he shrugs and acts like he doesn't know what I'm on about, what are the hell.exe, we get to school, it's almost 7.30, the sun isn't up, I start getting more and more freaked, by 10 I'm literally panicking, still dark and no sign of dawn, no one is talking about it, ask the teacher WTF, she also acts like I'm talking gibberish, don't know what else to do, end up just pretending to be okay with it, hang out with friends at lunch, quietest I've ever heard it, go home, spend the night in my room, say I'm not feeling good but really I just feel like I'm losing my mind, like seriously I thought I had completely lost my mind, eventually pass out despite being panicked. The second my head hits the pillow, it's morning, feel like I've just slept 8 hours, it's light out, instant relief, mom comes in, gets me up, tell her about my dream, huh, maybe it was your way of dealing with yesterday, stomach drops, what? You were in such a strange mood all day, Anon. You just sulked around like something was wrong, get up, turn on news, it's tomorrow, yesterday happened, I was not dreaming, talk to everyone and here's the version they told me, I woke up and wouldn't say anything to anyone, was really distant and cold all day, everyone said they thought something must have been wrong, I kept talking about how the sun wouldn't come up, parents thought I was high, friends thought I was possessed, no one remembers the day the way I do, no idea what happened that day in 8th grade, 